right. I so love getting out in the community and talking to people about the work that not only our zoo is doing, but zoos all around the country and even the world are doing to assist in the conservation of some really imperiled animals. And tigers are one of my favorites. I'm a cat person. I've been working most of my 30 year career with cats in some form. Um, some of you may know about the clouded leopard breeding program we have here at the zoo. That's an area that, or a, um, a, a program that I've been very involved with for a very long time. So really my specialty is Asian cats and I just can't get enough of them and I'm just thrilled to share not only the challenges that face them out in the wild, but really try to inspire people to know that everything, everyone here can do something in their life to make a difference to help a wild cat survive into the future. And I'll talk about that at the very end. I can't ever not talk about conservation, even though I'm talking about science mostly here tonight. I did bring a number of uh, exhibit items up here at the front. Some of you had a chance to look at those earlier. If you'd like to look at them after the film, you're welcome to do that as well. Also, I want to let you know I want to keep things really informal this evening, so if you have a question as I'm going along, please just raise your hand or shout at me to stop and I'll be happy to answer it right then. And last, I do want to thank all of you for coming out tonight despite the very important, apparently, sporting event that's going on. I am not a football, right? Yes. That's how bad I am. I don't even know what it is, but I'm not a fan, so I appreciate you folks, maybe some of you tearing yourselves away from the screen to come and join us this evening. So we're gonna start right off with, I have a question for you guys. I'm gonna show you a few pictures of some animals up here, and I want you to tell me what they have in common. So the first is a herd of beautiful Przewalski horses from Mongolia, and an amazing California condor, black-footed ferret, and a gorgeous red wolf. What do these animals have in common? Anybody know? I want to take a wild guess. All endangered. They are all endangered, but they have something even more really exciting, I think, in common. Something relevant to our talk tonight. Yes. They've been reintroduced to the wild through breeding programs and zoos around the world. Right on. Gold star. Perfect. Yes. These four species actually, at one time, were completely extinct in the wild. They were gone. And if it weren't for, in large part, the breeding efforts at zoos around the world, they would be completely extinct. But they have all been reintroduced out into the wild and all have populations that are considered fairly stable and continuing to grow. They still have their challenges, but it's pretty exciting to know that we can have animals that were completely gone and we have been able to revive them because of conservation efforts in large part to many zoos. This guy down here is one that's really special to all of us at Point Defiance, the red wolf. We do have a very robust breeding program for those animals. In fact, when they became extinct in the wild, it was to bring the 17 remaining animals into the population at Point Defiance Zoo and Aquarium. So your zoo is responsible for the continued survival of these animals out in the wild. It's pretty neat. Yes, sir. Uh, how many are there in the wild? In the wild, there's estimated around 100 or so. There are two sites that they've reintroduced them to. They're a tough case. They have all sorts of problems. We're not here to talk about canids tonight, or I could go on and on about that. Um, they actually will hybridize with coyotes, mm -hmm. and they look so much like coyotes that people hunt coyotes. They're protected from hunting, but it's easy to mistake them, so they are shot quite a bit as well. Mm -hmm. And they also face problems due to climate change. So they've got still a host of problems. They're probably the least secure of all the species that you see listed up there. But we have done some good work with them, for sure. So let's talk about tigers, though. Tigers are a incredibly, critically endangered animal, uh, an animal that could very well go extinct completely in our lifetime. Some of you may have come up and seen my display here where I actually show how many of the different types of tigers are left. And it's going to take a real complex interplay of all sorts of people and agencies to try to keep these guys alive. Let me show you for a second point out where these different cats are from. If you saw those bottles up here, you'll see there are a bunch of different types of tigers. They used to have quite a large range throughout Southeast Asia, but very few of them remain. You can see the green is the present range, and the yellow is where they used to be historically. And it's actually kind of deceiving, I think, even what it shows is the present range, because it looks like that would hold a lot of tigers. So those are places where tigers are found, but their density is very low. Tigers need a lot of space, so one reserve might not hold very many cats at all. 
And a big problem that most large carnivores who take a lot of space up, a problem that they face is they, their habitat just isn't connected very well anymore. So there might be all these disparate reserves that animals can't move back and forth. And that can really impact their ability to survive because when you have these small isolated populations, you run into all sorts of problems with low genetic diversity. So I want to show you one other slide, and then I might pop back to this one just for a second. I kind of realized that maybe I should have done these in a different order. But I wanted to point out that there are nine subspecies of tigers. So there's only one species, but subspecies are kind of a lower level distinction where we differentiate them based on some physical characteristics, also on their range. And this has been confirmed lately through genetic analysis. It's nice we have that tool now so they, uh, researchers can look even more closely at the DNA makeup of these animals and make determinations of uh, ones that are different enough to be classified as different subspecies. And I'm gonna use my little pointer up here. You can see this image up on the top. The ones in gray are the three extinct subspecies. And the most, one most recently extinct was the Javan tiger, which was declared extinct in 1980 after no animals had been seen in the wild for about a decade. So that's an animal, you know, in most of our lifetimes has become extinct. The Bali tiger, so these two, the Bali and the Javan, they both came from islands. Island animals are very vulnerable to extinction because their range is so limited and where they live in Southeast Asia, the human populations have just grown like crazy. The Caspian tiger, I'm gonna go back to that slide in a second and show you where they were found. Um, they became extinct in 68. So you can see the remaining tigers, the numbers of their population are listed here. The South China tiger down there at the bottom, that's actually an animal that is now considered extinct in the wild. They've been mounting all sorts of expeditions over the last decade or so to try to find any remaining ones and they haven't been able to. So they're all now mostly in Chinese zoos about 100 of those remaining. So the future does not look good for the South China tiger either. And then you can see the, the other subspecies, and I wanna just pop back to that map here for a second so I can point out where those guys live. So the Sumatran tiger, this is the island of Sumatra, and that's mostly what we're gonna be talking about this evening. That's the primary uh, race that we have at the zoo. The, um, this is the island of Java, where that tiger became extinct. That little tail at the end there, that's the island of Bali, where the other one became extinct. And then if you go up here, the, um, well, the Bengal tiger is, oh, where am I? Bengal tiger is found in here, India and Nepal, in Bhutan, this area. And then the Indo-Chinese tiger is found in this range in kind of Northern Thailand through Cambodia and Laos. And then there's also Malayan tigers. And we have one Malayan tiger at the zoo. And that cat is found on the Malayan peninsula here in Malaysia, and then also up here in um, Southern Thailand. So it's a little bit confusing. And oh, and then the Amur, we call it the Amur tiger now. It's probably what you grew up knowing, the Siberian tiger. That's found in Siberia. And if you look at this inset map up here, it's way up here in the edge. And here's this is exploded view just on this coastal region of Russia and a little bit into China. And then I mentioned the Caspian tiger that was is also extinct. That was once found in this area, a huge range on the Caspian Sea and the countries of Turkey and a lot of those Middle Eastern countries, and they were wiped out by hunting pressure. All right, so how do we save tigers? That's a pretty important consideration. It takes a really complex interplay of all sorts of things, um, from government policy, creating endangered species protection laws, creating nature reserves, law enforcement efforts. In many cases, for tigers in particular, their demise has been due to poaching, illegal hunting. Also research in the field. This is a great photo taken by a camera trap from scientists who study these guys to determine their range. And of course, education is a huge factor. And this is some, uh, a picture of some folks at our zoo doing tiger interpretation to do uh, endangered species conservation education. So all those things are important. And what I think a lot of people don't realize, zoos are really involved in all this stuff. I think so many folks think that zoos are just all about these populations that are set aside from nature and that we don't have an interplay with what's going out, going on out in the wild. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Most zoos today now contribute huge amounts of money and time and staff resources 
to working on programs out in the wild as well. And I've been very fortunate to participate in many of those programs in Borneo relating to our clouded leopard work. So it's very gratifying for me to be able to do that to enhance my job, but it's also just so great that we're able to use our skills and our um, expertise and bring that to support these wild populations as well. But one way that we really can make a difference is, as I mentioned at the beginning, we can serve as really kind of a lifeboat for these super endangered animals. And I think that's a really fitting metaphor for tonight, watching the Life of Pi movie, right? If any of you have seen it before, you know the story. It's all about a tiger in a lifeboat. And I remember when I first saw that image, I thought, I don't know if that was intentional, but you know, that's kind of a, a really cool uh, image to think about. So, a lot of people still though, when we talk about breeding endangered species in zoos or breeding an animal like a tiger, I think it's very confusing to a lot of people because most folks, I think, think you can just grab a male tiger, a female tiger, you put them together and love blooms and you have tiger cubs, right? No, it's way, way, way more complicated than that. And I wanna talk a little bit about what that looks like tonight. And I have only the time to go into it in a very broad overview, but hopefully you will still find that interesting. So I have a question for you. When we talk about breeding a population of any animal, really, in a zoo, we have finite space, right? So that's a really important thing to talk about up front. We have to manage these animals as a small population. Just like these small populations in the wild with maybe 350 Sumatran tigers left in the wild, in zoos, there's even fewer. So what's the best strategy? And here I'm gonna give you two options. Do we want to breed as many animals as we can? These animals are crazy endangered. We need to ramp up their numbers as fast as possible. Or do we want to just breed a few animals in a real selective basis? Which one do you think? Number one or number two? Two. Two, smart audience. I kind of led you in that direction too, though, I think. Well, if you do that right, this is what you end up with. Have you guys seen the cubs at the zoo? Aren't they adorable? Yeah, we're so fortunate to have had this great litter of three this year. So these are our babies when they were, I think maybe a month old or so, maybe three weeks, a month old. They're now about three months old. And just, I have to do my little promo for the zoo first. They go out every day, almost always every day. I think, we ha I think they've been making it every day. If the weather got really atrocious, we might not put them out. But um, they go out every day at 11 o'clock and they're usually out for a couple hours in the Asian Forest Sanctuary. So make sure you go by and see them while they're still little if you haven't had a chance yet. But how do we go about breeding these animals selectively? What does that mean? Well, let me talk a little bit about what that looks like. So first of all, the most important thing we have to consider is that our zoo, Point Defiant Zoo here in Tacoma, Washington, we are not a popular, we don't hold a population of tigers. We hold a few tigers, but we have to consider those animals as part of a larger population because we can't get the outcome of our breeding program in terms of having enough genetic diversity if we just had this kind of insular approach to breeding our animals. So this is how we do it. I hope most of you know we are a member, or we're an accredited member of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, which all the, you know, you want, you want to go to accredited facilities. There are tons of other places around the country that are not accredited, and there's a certain set of standards in terms of animal care and education and conservation that we have to meet. Yes? Hi, sorry, that, um, I had a question a little bit earlier about that. So the um, zoos that the tigers are at now, um, especially the species that have 100 left that were fully extinct in the wild, are there standards that all these tigers are in places with high standards like this, or? That's a great question. Right. Yeah, and it, it, it varies. No, they, not, they are not all at those kinds of zoos. And what I mean by that is because they're not even all in the US. So the South China tiger is the one that has only animals existing in zoos, that 100, and most of those are in China. And unfortunately, the standards in their zoological institutions are very much behind ours in terms of animal husbandry and care, even the diet that they feed them, how they care for them. It's variable, I mean, some zoos are better than others over there, but I have found, I haven't been to China, but I've been to many Asian zoos and their standards are, a lot of them still way, way, way behind ours. So in the US, and that's actually a good segue to what I wanna mention uh, with this slide too. So when we think about this kind of bigger population beyond just our zoo borders, 
We have other zoos throughout this network. There's about, I think, 220 now accredited zoos in the US. And so we manage these animals all as one big group. And I'll talk about how we do that. But the first start of that is that we establish these managed populations in terms of an SSP, a species survival plan. So it, as far as tigers go, we have SSPs in the US for three of the tiger subspecies that I mentioned. We have them for the Sumatran tigers, for the Amur or Siberian tiger, and then we have it for the Malayan tiger. So the US has kind of globally stepped up and said, those are the three subspecies we're gonna concentrate on because we can't do them all. We just don't have the space in zoos. But Europe is taking different ones and Australia is part of that and some of the better zoos in Asia are also doing that. We're managing them globally by kind of splitting them up regionally. How do we do that? What does this mean to have a managed population? Oh, first I thought I'd point this out. We do this for lots of animals, not just tigers. And so these are examples of some of the other SSP programs that we have at Point Defiant Zoo. So some of your favorite animals may be listed among those. But it all starts with having, first of all, before I even talk about this, it, it starts with a group of people who are passionate about the species. I'm on the management committee for the clouded leopard and it's because I'm passionate about them. I just, I want so much to work for their conservation. And there are plenty of people in zoos around the country who feel the same way for tigers. So it starts with one person who's, in, and they're volunteers. And when I say volunteer, they work for zoos, but they step up to take on the role of the coordinator for the SSP to manage the breeding of that species. So there's one person who's the coordinator, and then there's a management team of interested people from zoos all around the country who also work with that um, program. And so these SSPs, they're the ones who will get together and have meetings, the coordinator tracks all the lineage of these animals, and then they make breeding recommendations for what animals should go where for breeding. And I'll talk about what that means in a second. But it all starts with a stud book. You guys have probably heard of a stud book before. Have you ever read about racehorses or know about that. Stud books are really important documents. They contain, they contain all the data on each individual animal within the population. So this is the cover of the Sumatran Tiger stud book and it is compiled by the coordinator and they also work with another group of people called population managers who actually are staff members of our association, the AZA. And you can see a list of what's contained in a stud book and I have a photo of our stud book entry for tigers. So this was produced in June of 2013, so it does not include our newest babies, but it's got everybody else. And let me just walk you through this really quickly. It's pretty obvious. So Tacoma, that's us. And each animal has a line across. And if you go all the way here, you can see the name of our cats. And um, so some of these might be familiar to some of you. And it has their birth dates up here, this is birth. Here's a transfer. So birth, Jaya was actually born in Seattle at the Woodland Park Zoo and transferred to Tacoma back in 2004. So pretty obvious. And then when they have cubs, it will say who their parents are and it will say how they were rare, how they were reared, parent raised or hand reared. So this was Dumai, our cub born a couple years ago. He's the one who is been, being raised now with our Malayan tiger. So you don't see the Malayan tiger in here because he's in a different stud book since he's a Malayan tiger. This last one here, this is Kali, who's our oldest baby, except for the cubs. She's like a year, just over a year, maybe a year and a half now. And so the new cubs aren't in here yet. So we take this information and there's pages and pages of this representing all the cats. There are currently, I think the number stands at about 72 Sumatran tigers that are in our managed population. Not very many, right? That's a small number of cats. So they take all this information and they're able to um, make breeding recommendations in order to try to keep that population going and growing, hopefully. So when they do that, there's two considerations primarily. And then this, I could get crazy technical. Well, I probably couldn't because I'm not an expert at it and I'd probably say all sorts of wrong stuff. But Overall, there are two main things that we want to consider when we have a small population. It's all about the fact that these populations are so tiny. If we had 100,000 tigers, we could let them do whatever they wanted. Whoever wanted to breed to whoever, it wouldn't matter. But when there's 72 tigers, it really matters. 
We have to maintain their demographics, and I'll talk about that word in a second. And then we also have to maintain genetic diversity, which I've alluded to previously. So let's talk about demographics for a second. Let me show you this really pretty picture. This thing is called an age pyramid. And it's really a very simple model. Get my little pointer guy out here again. If you look at this, there's an X and a Y axis. The X axis has the Y kind of going up the middle here. To the left, these are male animals. To the right are female animals. And, and then going up the Y axis, th these are stepped in years. So here's one year olds, two year olds, three year olds, four year olds, five year olds, and so forth. This is a perfect, beautiful bell curve of a demographic. What you want to see in a population is that you've got lots of young animals because those are going to be your breeding animals in the future. And then they start breeding like in here and not everyone's going to breed, but hopefully enough of them will. And then as they start to get older and older and older, they start to die off until you've got, this is your oldest living animal, which is a female who's maybe, you know, this is a fake one, but she could be, um, you know, 20 years old or, or more. So that's what it, a perfect age pyramid looks like. That's what you want. Well, let me show you what you get when you're dealing with Sumatran tigers. <laughs> that's the Sumatran tiger age pyramid. So it's a little bit of a mess. It's not the worst I've seen. It's not the best I've seen. But here's our total population. I'll give you a quick little um, primer on how we uh, keep track of animals in the zoo. This represents males and females. This is how we calculate, or not calculate, but how we signify our populations. So 41 males, 31 females. What would this point O be, do you think? What, what would be there if there was a number? Like if it said one there, what would that mean, do you think? Babies? It could mean babies. If it's not a male and it's not a female, what could it be? You'd think maybe neutered. We still count those as males. It's kind of a trick question. It means we don't know. It's an unknown. So in tigers, we usually don't have a number here because it's pretty easy to sex a tiger. It's pretty obvious. There's a lot of animals. It's really hard to tell. Uh, so like, I, I don't know why this just came to mind. Beavers are really hard to tell. They have internal testes, so you can't see them. You can't, it's really hard to tell a male from a female. And all their equipment's inside. Makes sense, I guess, if you live in the water. You don't want stuff hanging out. Um, so anyway, just a, a quick aside. So, um, so here's our pyramid. And what this means, and hopefully you understand as I explained, and this even has some values listed. So females are all these guys on this side. Here's the dividing line right here. Females over here, males over here. These are the ages, ones, twos, starting to get older here. And so then these are the oldest tigers. So you'll notice by our number here, and even you can just tell by looking at the graph that we're skewed, right? We're, we got quite a few more males than we have females. That's bad demographics. So when I said we want to maintain good demographics, we want that nice even bell curve as much as, much as we can get it. We don't really have control over this. You know, we can't, we're not to the point of sophistication in our technology yet where we can select for male or female tiger cubs. But um, the good news is, did I tell you what sex our cubs are? Female. All females. We did like this little dance of joy when we sexed them for the first time. So they're not included in this pyramid because this is old. So that's good. That made a pretty good progress in, in fixing that skew up, right? Um, you'll also notice something kind of interesting is that there's a gap right here where no tigers were born for a couple of years. And that's because the SSP actually put a moratorium on breeding these guys for a few years because they had to do a lot of, look, it was back, you know, 15, 16 years ago. They were really still perfecting some of this genetic analysis work. So they wanted to stop breeding until they could figure out um, if they really had a handle on who was related to who and work out the stud book a little bit better. Yes, sir. What's the difference between the dark blue and the light blue? Yeah, the dark blue and the light blue, um, I'm not, oh, I think because they, um, the, if it's light blue, it means they're not considered part of the breeding population. So they're part of the population, but what's the deal with when they're one or two years old? Yeah, they can't breed yet, right? And then these animals might have reasons that they're, you know, by the time they're this old, they're not going to be breeding anyway. But sometimes you'll see animals that are lower in the population that are taken out of consideration of the breeding population for reasons of maybe physical ailments. Maybe they have 
a problem with some of their reproductive organs, they're sterile, or maybe it's an animal that's so crazy aggressive when they've tried to pair it before, it's killed a mate a couple times, that animal could be taken out of consideration for future breeding. So that would be the, the difference there. Okay, so you guys get the maintaining demographics part. Well, maintaining the genetic diversity part is, I think you guys all know what that means, right? We want as many different genetic complements in these animals um, as possible, which is again, very hard to do in a small population. But why do we care about that? There's a number of reasons why it's important to have really good diversity. One is just overall your populations are healthier. If you've got this just really wide complement of genes, they infers disease resistance on your population. So animals are able to withstand epidemics that might come around. Much better fertility and cubs survive at a much higher rate. And I'll give you an example of bad fertility in a second. And this is really key. A lot of people don't think about this, but um, if there's a drastic change to the environment, the more diversity in your population, the higher likelihood that someone in your population has those characteristics to withstand that environmental change, right? That's natural selection at work right there. So if you are able to withstand a drought, maybe a little bit better than the rest of your population, you're gonna survive in a drought year and you're hopefully gonna breed and pass those drought resistant genes on. So if that population didn't have that characteristic, they would have just died out completely. So we do see evidence of poor genetic diversity. We see this in the wild and we also see it in zoos. And here's two classic animals we see it in, the red wolf and the cheetah. Cheetahs are absolutely renowned for having tons of genetic diversity issues. It's estimated they went through a bottleneck episode where almost all cheetahs died out except for a few. And so they all came back from this tiny, tiny population and as a result have these issues. So we see poor fertility. That's really the number one problem we see with bad genetic diversity. We see these crazy deformed sperm. We see very low sperm counts, poor motility. So the, the sperm just can't do their job. We also see a higher rate of disease. Oh my gosh, the diseases that cheetahs get are just freakish how many things affect those guys. And the same thing with cheetahs, they're highly susceptible to stress. We think red wolves are as well. We're actually embarking on a study at our zoo on a disease called inflammatory bowel disease. And they think there's maybe a stress component in that. And they get that in the wild as well. So one last thing I wanna talk about really is how we select to maintain that diversity. And this gets a little jargony, but I'm gonna go through it really fast because it's not super exciting, but I think it gives you a little bit of insight. So back to that stud book, what happens is these population managers take all that data and they plug it into this really cool software. And the software just kind of churns away and actually kind of spits out recommended animals to breed to one another. And it does that because there's all these formulas in there that calculate these really cool values. And one of the most important ones is a value called mean kinship. And that just means how closely related a single individual animal is to the rest of the population. So let me show you what I mean by that. So if you have a high value for mean kinship, that means you're related to everybody. You've got brothers and sisters and cousins and aunts and uncles all over the place. Um, an example is that for an actual value is you'd be 0.5 mean kinship to your sibling. So that's, that's very high mean kinship. A low mean kinship means the opposite, as you'd expect. It means you don't have very many relatives at all. So what would be the very most valuable animal you could have in your population, do you think? One that's not related to anybody. Yeah, and we have a name for those. Those are called founders. So founders are animals that bring brand new genetics into the population. And so what do you think their mean kinship value is? Zero. Zero, that's right. So those are really awesome animals to have around. But the problem we have is we don't want to waste those animals. So if we've got this awesome animal with a really low mean kinship, we don't want to breed it to an animal with a high mean kinship because all of a sudden you've just totally reduced the value of that animal. So the more founders we have, the better. And that is a huge, huge problem. Oh, here's just a little quick test for you guys. Which of these cubs do you think would be, these are cloudy leopards, sorry. Which one would have the best, be the most valuable in terms of breeding? Tell me if it's one, two, three, or four. Three. So who's the least related to any other animal? I hear a lot of threes, I heard one four. 
Another four. I see some more fours who don't want to commit vocally. <laughs> yeah, it's number four. So I know you think that there's in, in this again. We don't have time to go into all this stuff, unfortunately. But if you think about it, just in terms of who's got the fewest um, of the of the Cubs at the bottom, who's got the fewest relatives in common? Because these guys have essentially all of those cats in common. And that guy only has a couple cats in common. Does that kind of make sense? I wish I had more time, but sorry. Okay, so when we make these breeding recommendations, we have to consider some things beyond, oh, one thing I forgot to mention about founders is part of our problem is with these small populations, no matter how well we manage them, we always run into this problem of numbers that we just don't have enough founders that are ever gonna increase the diversity. Our long-term goal for these managed populations is to maintain a 90% level of genetic diversity over 100 years. That's kind of our litmus test. And they can churn out these predictions with this software to tell us if that's possible with our given population numbers. And right now, our population is at 89% diversity for Sumatran tigers in zoos. So what that tells us is we have got to get some new blood in if we wanna to continue to keep that high, because it'll continue to just sort of slowly go down unless we introduce more founders. And so we've started these global management programs now where we're managing them beyond just the US, but into all of the world. So there's now a Sumatran tiger global management plan, and we've started importing some cats from zoos in other parts of the world to our population, because they've been separate for so long, and that really helps, that provides new founders. So, but when we make recommendations, there's just a couple things we have to consider in addition to their genetics. Are they old enough to breed? Are they too old to breed? If they've never bred before and they're already like a 12 year old cat, chances are you know, a lot lower that they're gonna breed. And we also have to think about where they are. Moving a tiger's a big deal. <laughs> you don't just say pack your suitcase and put them on Alaska Airlines and off he goes. Big deal to, we have to train them to get ready to go into a crate so it's not stressful for them. We have to make tons of arrangements with airlines. Sometimes we even have to charter planes because you can't really fly a tiger on regular air cargo. FedEx and some of the other special uh, cargo carriers have been really kind to us and help us with that, but it's a big deal. But if we do it right, it's certainly worth it. These are, um, that's a current cub. This, oh, these are both actually photos of current cubs. I love this one on the left where the cub <laughs> just totally attacking mom and she doesn't know it's coming. And we also do what we can to really use these cats, not only as the lifeboat for their wild counterparts, but really to engage our visitors and our community at large in, cloud of, or in um, tiger conservation, because that's what it's all about. If we don't rally people around the absolute peril that these cats are in and the critical state that if we don't do something soon, within you know, the next few years, they may be gone forever, and this is a really great way to do it. So our populations not only help their wild counterparts through hopefully serving as a, a repository of that genetic information, but hopefully to inspire folks to want to protect them. The Minnesota Zoo has been really huge at getting all the SSP holding institutions together through this tiger conservation campaign. You can make donations directly to tiger conservation in Asia there. We at the zoo have been doing this Pause for the Cause project over the last year. The uh, production of palm oil, which is in most of the foods that we buy, packaged foods in the supermarket, palm oil is produced directly by deforesting tropical Asian areas where tigers and other wild cats and other creatures live. And there's a way that we can do palm oil production sustainably. And so please visit our website if you're interested in learning more about that. And I've got our website listed there as well. And does anyone have any questions about any of the stuff I talked about? I know I went so fast, I tried to cover so much and still keep it fairly short. So I apologize for that. But um, I really wanna thank all of you for coming this evening and thanks to Philip and the rest of the staff at the Grant for giving me a chance to talk about tiger conservation and tiger breeding. Questions, yes. 
breeding to animals still in the wild. There have been a few occasions, not in the Sumatran population, but in the, I think it was the Indochinese tigers, they had some that they had to trap because they were nuisance tigers. They were problems and really like killing a bunch of livestock. And they took advantage of that and actually incorporated them into the breeding population as founders. So that was a big deal and really helpful for the genetics, but it doesn't happen very often. More likely, if there's a problem tiger, people just shoot it, you know, don't even think about trying to trap it. Yes. I read somewhere that there are more tigers uh, kept by private people in Texas than there are still alive in the wild. There are a lot more. Yes, if you didn't hear that, uh, there's so many tigers in private hands that are not part of these managed programs. In some states, you can just go buy a tiger and keep it in your backyard. It's ridiculous. It's getting a little better, but it's still a huge, huge problem. And that's really sad to say. None of those are purebred. We don't know the lineage of any of them. So they can't be used in these breeding programs anyway because they're all kind of mutt tigers with no no pedigrees and i'm getting the signal i think that we need to wrap up right because we need to get our movie started okay well thank you so much again i really appreciate your attention tonight thank you, thank you.